the southwest peninsula, Devon and Cornwall. Let's see what the guidebook has to say about it. The counties of Devon and Cornwall form a rocky peninsula jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean. North and south, the country is bounded by noble cliffs formed of highly folded old rocks which have been torn and crumpled by the earth movements of many millions of years ago. This gives rise to an irregular and steep topography. Yes, it's a rough, wild coast, all right, if that's what the book means. It was here, you know, that the last ships of the Spanish Armada were driven on the rocks and sunk. Inland from the coast, the country forms a high rolling plateau. The fields are divided by wide earth banks, and this undulating tableland is cut and intersected by deep winding valleys and sheltered coombs. Here and there, the pattern of the agricultural lands is broken into by the deep pits of slate and granite quarries. Down be Delaball now. There's a huge slate quarry they say was begun 500 years ago. Wouldn't have been much more than a scratch on the edge of Bodmin Moor then. But now it is over 400 feet deep. And they still can't see the end of their digging and blasting and hauling. Then there's a bit here about the China clay mines. Characteristic of the region, it says, are the white conical tips of the China clay workings. Aye, there's no doubt you're in Cornwall when you see those queer white hummocks and huge pit holes. Like a sort of weird moon country it is. While further to the west, the headworks of the Cornish tin mines. Ah, now those tin mines. They must be about the oldest in the world, I reckon. I've heard the Phoenicians worked them 2,000 years ago or more. But they mostly shut down since I was a lad. Conspicuous features of the landscape are the great granite massifs of Bodmin and Dartmoor. Here, cultivation ceases. Yes, but we graze a good few cattle and sheep on the margins, you know. And then there's the wild moorland ponies that live there. You don't want to forget about them. Well, and what else has your book got to say about us? Looking back, it says, the open tablelands are seen to be windswept and treeless, exposed as they are to the full force of Atlantic gale and storm. The woodlands and orchards, seeking shelter, line the valley sides. Ah, man and beast seek shelter too, because can blow a proper hurricane down here when it's a mine to, I can tell you. So all through the southwest, you'll find our farms and villages set well down in the valleys. Snug and cosy they are, too. Pretty whitewashed cottages of stone and slate, or cob and thatch, or harder buildings of granite from the quarries we were talking about. Then it says here, because of the mild winters and absence of frosts, bulbs bloom early out of doors. Yes, it's in the valleys to the south they have the bulb farms, mostly. Oh, it may be rough and stormy down here in the winter, but when the flowers and the trees come out in the spring, there isn't no prettier part in all England. The orchards are for the most part rough grass orchards of cider apple and pear trees, which are grazed by the cattle and sheep. Well now, when it comes to farming, maybe I can help you, because that's in my line. You see, every district's got to suit itself to local conditions. And down here, because we have a mild, moist climate and rather shallow, patchy soils, we are grassland farmers, mostly. Engaged in the breeding of cattle, sheep and pigs, it says. Hi, and a goodish amount of dairying, too. On the valley sides, which are too steep to cultivate, and down in the valley bottoms, which are too wet for crops, we have our permanent pastures. While up on the flatter fields, between the valleys, we have our plowland. Naturally, being livestock farmers, most of the crops we grow are for feeding to the animals in the winter. And each of the arable fields is sown down to grass again every three or four years. Fields and farms are generally small in the southwest. Ha ha, and that's on account of the country here too. All ups and downs, twists and turns, so that horses are still often more used to us than tractors. Then there's something here about the survival of the Celtic tradition of family farming has resulted in a general absence of farm cottages, 
and labor is scarce. It is indeed. So we're mostly family farmers down here, whether we like it or not. Take my family now, in Coombe Valley. Uh, that's in North Cornwall, close to the Devon borders. Allen's our name, and there's four of us farms there. There's my younger brother, Frank, my eldest brother, Fred, my son-in-law, Tom Banbury, and myself, I'm Ernest. Now, why don't you shut up that book and come and have a look around for yourself? Frank has the farm up at Stowe Barting. That used to be father's place. But Frank took it over when the old man died. Frank goes in for breeding, mostly, and he buys and sells all over the country. He keeps a sizey flock of Devon Close wool ewes, and being his own shepherd-like, he's pretty busy at lambing time. It's surprising how things can go wrong with sheep, no matter how careful you be. And then there's always some as need help at lambing time. <coughs> Well, that's one more little one brought safely into the world. Another twin, too. Her will be as right as rain, you'll see, when her mother's had time to give her a lick and a polish. We was all of us born at Stowe Barting, and that's an interesting old place. Used to be the home of Sir Richard Grenville. The old mansion's gone now, but you can still see the huge walls they built to protect it from the sea winds. And where they used to keep the coach and horses, Frank keeps his pigs now. That's Frank's son, Bevel, bringing in their feed. With Dad's old carter, Amos. Bevel's just turned 19, but he's getting to be quite a farmer already. And tell him about the women folk too, Ernest. There's Mary Allen now, Frank's youngest girl. Mary's only lately left school, tis true, but she has to do her share of the housework just the same. Especially since her mother was took bad with the arthritis. That's a terrible handicap, you know, especially for a farmer's wife. Because we have our side of things to look after just as much as any of the men. Then across on the other side of the valley, down through the woods, across the stream, and up past the mill is Lee Farm. Fred lives there. He's the bachelor of our family and a big breeder of pedigree red Devon cattle. The red rubies of the West, we call them. Ernie's bulls have won prizes in the big shows all over the country. They run pretty big, our red Devon bulls. That one there, Valley Thunderer, he'll weigh a ton if he weighs an ounce. Then down at the far end of Fred's fields, all along by the stream and up on the other side, is my farm, Burridge. I've got about 200 acres mixed. Some of it's good land, and some only fair to middling. But my pastures are more sheltered than theirs, so I go in for milk production more, and do a milk round of my own. Uh, just round about the district, you know. Our daughter, Alice, she does all the milking, and feeds and tends the dairy herd as well. Butter, cream, poultry, that's my department. And Ernest doesn't have nothing to do with that at all. That's the usual custom down here for the wives to look after the poultry side. And any money we make out of it belongs to us. So that's Burridge Farm where I live. I've been there 25 years now. And it's the only home I've ever known, except for Stowe Barting, of course. The next farm up, you can see it clearly from my fields, is Sanctuary. Tom Bembury. You remember I told you he's my son-in-law. He farms there. He's got about 120 acres all told, and awkward land it is. Tom used to work for me at one time, about the best plowman I ever had. And then he married our eldest girl, Nellie. And of course there was nothing for it, but they had to have a place of their own. They farmed the whole of Sanctuary Farm between them, with just the help of a young lad from the village. Of course, if they do get in a fix, 
I do what I can to help them out with the loan of a man or a tractor. All the same, a place of that size is plenty big enough for two people to manage. Yes, it is. I often wonder how Nell and Tom gets through with it all. Because we haven't got any gas or electricity down here, you know, to make the house work easier. It's cut the logs from the wood yourself if you want to have a fire. Well, now, what else is there I can tell you about Coombe Valley? We've seen Stobarton and Burridge and Lee. Oh, there's the old water mill, of course. That's right down at the bottom end, near where the stream runs out to the sea. And that's in the family, too, in a manner of speaking. George Heard has it, and he's a sort of distant cousin of mine. They come from down Lanston Way. In father's time, all the corn was grown at the mill. But now it is chiefly used for sawing timber. The timber comes from along the sides of our valley. It is a sweetly pretty place, the old mill house. And in the spring and summer, they do a busy trade there, serving Cornish cream teas to the visitors. Well, now I think you've met nearly all of us who live in this valley. So let's take a look up the other end. Up past Frank's fields, and Fred's, and Tom's, and mine, to the village at the top. Coombe Hampton, it's called. Oh, yes. I saw the church towers sticking up through the trees. Proper old Cornish church it is, too. Well, once a fortnight, they hold a market at Coombe Hampton, and then all the farmers from miles around come in with their wives and families. You know, a kettle market's always a bit of a puzzle to me. There never seems to be any plan or order about it. And, well, most of you look as though you're just hanging around, waiting for something to turn up. And that's more or less what we are doing. The farmers and the animals, too. But don't they forget that what do turn up, a sale, or a deal, or a bit of bargaining, may be the most important thing in the week for us. Of course, there's always some that dropped in for a bit of gossip. But Lord bless you, it does you good to hear your troubles sometimes, and hear other people's, too. Then there's usually a few of the big dealers about, especially when the store cattle are being sold. They'll be sent off to fatten on the richer pastures up country. You always go up to the market, I suppose, you and your brothers? Aye, we generally look in sometime during the day. Frank, of course, has got to be there, because he does the sheep grading. And Fred's got a bunch in for sale today, so he's come along to make sure Frank grades them right. Then young Tom Bradley, he was thinking of buying a cone calf. And he asked me what I thought of them. Well, Tom, I said, I think you could do better than that and you know. Why not look around a bit first? It always pays to buy the best, I says to him. And while the men are down at the cattle market, we women do the shopping. Coombe Hamptons are quite enough place as a rule. But my word, you should see it market days. I found our Nellie there. She was looking for a spade for Tom to dig up the garden with. As if poor Tom hasn't enough to do already. Mary Allen from Stobarton was getting some things for her mother. You know, it's a funny thing. There's plenty of good shops in the town. But we mostly always buy from the market stalls. Seems to be a habit with us farmers' wives. Perhaps it's because we used to trade all our butter and eggs and poultry there in the old days. And then, of course, before we start home, the men always have to drop in at the White Hart to have one. Yes, well, there's a lot to be talked over market days. How prices were. What the government's going to be up to next. Why Jim Carter's leaving Wood Farm. And you know a pint or two helps the discussion along. So that's Coombe Valley. And though some parts of Cornwall may be bleaker, and in Devonshire you'll find it more soft and gentle country, it's pretty typical of how we live and farm down here in the warm and wet southwest. In general, then, it's a country of open, windswept uplands and deep, sheltered valleys, of steep slopes and small fields, a country of family farms with little outside help or labor. Aye, we've got to be able to do most everything for ourselves, that's true enough. The men in the fields, the women in the house and in the kitchen, no, it isn't easy farming country, not by a long chalk. But there's one thing to be said for it. It does breed very hardy animals. And then another thing. It's the sort of life that holds a family together and that hands the land on from father to son. 
For whatever may come, we have to make a go of it as best we can, just among ourselves. And when a man has put his best into a piece of land, him and his wife and his family, it isn't likely he'll want to leave it for any other in the country.